and uh, it is the last Saturday of the month. So here we are, it's all happening at ODC. So welcome to another edition of the Bliss Catchers. I must thank Team ODC for hosting us uh, month on month and putting together this uh, show for us. This is the 28, uh, 29th edition of the Bliss Catchers. It's the third season. And I'm very happy to welcome all of you. I see a lot of new faces, so thank you so much for joining us and joining us on time so we can start on time. Uh, the Bliss Catchers is actually a celebration of happiness. Uh, if you look at my guests today, I have uh, three of them actually, not two, and I'll tell you why we have three of them. Uh, we have Ram over there, we have Mahesh, and we have Tamar Selman over here. Uh, we have uh, three very happy people uh, who are doing stuff that they love doing. And that's why I say that the Bliss Catchers is actually a celebration of happiness. Uh, we uh, do this program month on month uh, to uh, celebrate the lives of people and the journeys of people <coughs> who have gone on to do what they love doing with their lives, in their lives. And uh, this morning, very interestingly, I was um, kind of rummaging through uh, some old stuff in my cupboard. And you know, in those good old days, we used to write diaries, personal journals. And uh, I managed to lay my hands on a, a diary from uh, somewhere you know, in one of the 80s, one of the years of the 80s. And uh, in those diaries, there used to be quotes of people on each day, uh, you know, on, on each page. And I saw a quote by uh, Confucius, which I, for some reason, seem to have circled and uh, uh, marked it as important. So the court is a, is a court that you must have all come across at some point in life, which is go find a job that you love and you don't have to work for even a day in your life. It's a very old and popular court and many of us have come across it. Yeah, so what about Jalaluddin Rumi now? Huh? What about Jalaluddin Rumi now? <laughs> <laughs> this, this morning it started with Confucius, so I stay with Confucius for now. People know that I love Jalaluddin Rumi's poetry and I do talk about him, but for a change today, it was Confucius that uh, started my day. So uh, I, I felt that that quote kind of resonates with um, what we try to do at the Bliss Catchers. Uh, of course, many years after, many, many centuries after uh, Confucius, it was um, uh, Joseph Campbell who uh, promoted the idea of following your bliss. And he said that if you follow your bliss, doors will open where only walls exist and only you will be able to see those doors. So that's the uh, journey that we try to capture here uh, month on month. We have interesting guests who have been with us and uh, today again we have two very interesting guests and I will introduce them very quickly. But uh, I'd also like to add why we do it. Which is when I say we, uh, why Vani, my wife and I do this program month on month. This is not the only program that we do. For us, our, our purpose in life is to inspire happiness. We ourselves are going through a very difficult, challenging, painful time in life. We're going through a back bankruptcy. If you Google us, you'll find us. Uh, we have a very strong internet footprint. And going through this very dark phase in our life, we find that we are very, very happy sharing what we have learned about life. And what we have learned is that it is possible to be happy despite your circumstances. Your circumstances cannot pin you down if you don't allow them to pin you down. And so inspiring happiness is our purpose. And we do not just one event, but we do four events across the uh, city, uh, all of them in different forms, different flavors. And the Bliss Catchers is one of them. Now, in a way, I was thinking about this when I was riding in here. I was thinking about a man who's, who's a good friend, who's a great filmmaker, uh, Gautam Vasudev Men. And Gautam made a very popular film called Vinay Tandi Varvai. And in that film, he unwittingly did a lot of service to Bliss Catchers. Uh, not the program itself, but Bliss Catchers in general. Because he said, uh, there is a character in that film who keeps answering Simbu's question. Simbu's always in a dilemma, if you remember that film, on should he go after the, uh, the girl or should he not go after the girl. And he says, the character called Ganesh says, Ingena Sulitha, Jesse Jesse Nusulitha. So I think the, the Bliss Catchers as a program, as, as a concept, 
really reminds people that we live one life. It's a limited period of earth. And we've got to listen to Ingena Soludu more than Ingena Soludu. So that's uh, really what the story behind Bliss Catchers is as an initiative, as a concept. And I'm happy to share with you somebody, present to you somebody who's really followed what he heard from here. And that brings me to uh, a very short segment before we go into the conversation itself. And this segment, segment is called the Bliss Catcher Impact. So in this segment, we have uh, a guest from the audience, uh, a member of the audience who's, who regularly is part of the Bliss Catchers program. We have an audience member coming and sharing with us what impact the series has made on their life, on their thinking. And this time, I have uh, my good friend and uh, 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 you know, a person who is really following his own bliss. He started uh, in his journey in that direction, Tamar Selvan. Uh, Tamar is uh, heading a startup called uh, Future Captains, where he's seeding the idea of bliss catching among young uh, people, among students particularly. He's going to talk to you about that. Uh, but he recently quit his job at uh, Cognizant uh, to, to be able to do what he loves doing. So I'm going to invite uh, Tamar Silvan to talk to us about what he picked up from the sessions of the sketchers that he has attended in the past. So over to you, Tamar. Here's your mic. Thank you so much for joining us today. So um, I think I was always in a sketcher because uh, before uh, I think uh, after I finished college, I chased my wife. She's right there. So so I always followed her passion. So right there, there's an example, but. Once I started my work, I think uh, somewhere I kind of um, kind of failed to figure out what I really can do with my life. Um, so for, I have been working for the last 16, 17 years, and Cognizant was my last uh, you know company. So I was just going through this kind of question that was very intriguing about like why is that we are always unhappy with the work that we do. Right? Most of us, I, I keep seeing people who are like keep worrying about the work they do. They don't like the boss, they don't like the subordinates, they keep complaining. And I was just wondering why this happens. And later I figured out that that we get to do things which we don't, generally don't like. And that leads to a lot of frustration, stress levels, and so on. Thanks to the pharmacies and hospitals that was being like, all this is adding up to the, uh, the entire scenario. So, Later I figured out that somewhere if we can come up with something which helps people to figure out what they can do with their life, kind of talk about what strengths they have rather than the weaknesses, right? rather than telling them what can they do with their life rather than what they cannot do. Because the world always focuses on our weaknesses. That's what I always figure out. Those, those are the kind of feedbacks I always receive. And Sometime in 2013, when I, uh, 2014, when I met Avis, I mean, kind, of, kind of struck a chord, and um, I thought, yeah, this is a man, somebody who talks about happiness, right? Because that is also I believe in. So that's when I got the seed of the idea of Fisher Capitalist, and I started pursuing this idea even further. So uh, kind of four years of employment and side by side, I had to pursue this idea because I thought somebody has to do it. Like Elon Musk says, right? Even the probability of failure is much higher. You just still you still have to do it because there's no other way, right? You, for things because it's very important for us to accomplish. So I kept my employment. I have to keep it going because I have a family, two kids, so I have to ensure that my bills are paid. But at the same time, I have to follow my heart because somewhere deep down, my I, I felt a sense of purpose. So thanks to Avis because I think um, Dr. P. Srinivas, that was their first. Uh, this catcher session. It was called as um, follow your bliss. Follow your bliss. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, Dr. Amika was also there. Uh, so I, I remember that conversation about Jeevan Pratt and all the stuff. You know, I started feeling like you know, I think I should just keep it going. And as he rightly said, doors will open. Um, probably, you know, I, I, after a lot of struggle and everything, I figured out that doors open. And 25th, 20, 2017 February. I came to a point when I had to take a decision of taking uh, a step out of cognizant. And thanks to Avis, I he said, I listened to it, and here I am, and I'm enjoying my life. And uh, I'm really happy to share this experience to you, find people uh, in front of my family as well. 
and I think um, I'm just looking forward to it because um, one day I think this this seat will also be mine, and Avis I think will still do this session, and that day is not you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Tamar, for sharing your thoughts. And uh, uh, most important, I think, uh, maybe under pressure of time, you didn't mention it. I think what, one of the things that he told us when he met us was, should I do it, should I not do it? He was in that dilemma. And I think all of us are in that dilemma at some point in life. Uh, we, we want to do something, but we have to do something else in order to keep, the, uh, keep our life going, which is paying the bills part of life going. And uh, my only contribution was borrowing from whoever wrote the script for Midnight Thandi Varabaya and whoever wrote the dialogue there. You know, in the end, the Tamil will follow up on it. And uh, the rest is all this. Future Captains is a very interesting initiative. Look them up, futurecaptains.com. What they are actually doing is encouraging young children, school children primarily, to follow their passion and link it to a profitable career path. Which is, uh, which is something that we often talk about on this show as well. So thank you, Tamar, for sharing that. That brings me, ladies and gentlemen, to the point in today's program where I'm ready to introduce my two guests. We have two wonderful gentlemen here, uh, both representing two different generations, but uh, following their bliss in, in their own unique, special ways. And I promise you, today's session is going to be, the conversation today is going to be absolutely soulful. Uh, so my first guest today is somebody who reached out to me for a completely different reason, uh, Mahesh. I, I don't know Mahesh from Adam, I didn't know him from Adam. And he happened to see a live um, a Facebook live feed of the Biscatcher edition of November last year, uh, which was the last season and we had um, Srikant of Agal Films and Sandeep Narayan, the musician with us. And uh, apparently he was watching the live feed, and he saw the reference to my book, Fall Like a Rose Petal, over there, and he was intrigued by the title of this book, and he reached out to me and he said, you've written this book, what is the name of the book? I forget the name, can you share it with me? And that's how we got connected. And we later met for a cup of coffee, because one of the things that Vani and I like to do is we love stories. And so, uh, in, in his brief introduction, he had said he had quit Cognizant. And what was he doing, I asked him, and he said, uh, right now, I'm just enjoying my life. And I thought that's a very powerful statement coming from somebody who's quit an uh, IT job and saying, I'm enjoying my life. This man is very interesting, so I invited him for a cup of coffee. And that's where I heard his story and his, uh, and his model of 25, 25, 25, which is 25 years to uh, learn, 25 years to earn, and 25 years to enjoy, assuming that lifespan is 75 years. And uh, what does he do now? He travels. He shoots pictures, he's a photographer, and he's a music lover, so he's got a initiative called Madrasana, uh, which takes a culture and art, uh, basically performing arts, and takes it out of the auditorium space into a natural setting. And what is his natural setting? His home garden in Besanagar. I thought that's a very, very powerful way of getting started on your journey, right? You don't wait for all the pieces to fall together. and. Uh, that's uh, Mahesh Venkateshwaran for you, ladies and gentlemen. For me, particularly, he's also Mr. Padips because he's got a double degree from Pitts Pilani. And uh, he worked with TCS and then later worked with um, uh, Cognizant until a uh, couple of years ago when he quit his job. And he's got a fascinating story. I, I, I don't remember much of it, because, although he did tell me about six to eight months back when we met for coffee. Uh, so I'm as eagerly looking forward to listening to his story as all of you. Thank you, Mahesh, for joining us. My other guest today is um, uh, Ram, Ramnath Chandrasekhar, a uh, wonderful young man. He's all of 28, and he's got a body of work which spans 15 years already. So uh, again, it's a bliss catcher introduction. I didn't know Ram existed on this planet. Uh, a bliss catcher who was with us last year pinged me. His name is Santosh of uh, Bambaram. Uh, he was in one of our editions last year. And he pinged me and he said, Avis and Mani, you should meet Ram. And since it came from a, a bliss catcher and the recommendation was so powerful, I googled on Ram, the story was interesting, and then we met. But what I found about the man was, you will find that when he gets here on stage and he starts talking to you, there's a glint in his eyes. 
you know, there is innocence and there is a spirit of adventure. There is a daring. There is a deep dive that he makes. And uh, that is very infectious. Uh, you cannot come away after meeting Ram without feeling inspired and saying, hey, if he can do it, we can do it too. You know, that's the feeling that I took away that day having coffee with you, Ram. He's touched the lives of over 50,000 children uh, by telling them stories of how to connect and conserve nature, connect with and conserve nature. And uh, he's traveled the length and breadth of the country. Uh, he's worked with uh, film crews, particularly in some of them, uh, National Geographic crews as well. And uh, he's also co-authored a book uh, at his young age called Ganga, More Than a River. Uh, he's been featured uh, in, in, on many occasions. And particularly, the couple of things that come to my mind are the Rolex Award. Mm -hmm. It wasn't a Rolex Award. Mm -hmm. It was the young, you were shortlisted for it. Yeah, so uh, the, he was shortlisted. He's very clear that, you know, we should not uh, hype this up. So I'm sorry for the actual mistake. But uh, he was shortlisted for the Young Lawrence uh, program of the Rolex series, right, in 2010. And was the Sanctuary won an award, the Sanctuary magazine, 2011, as the Young Naturalist Award. So those were a couple of good um, uh, you know, citations he received. He currently works uh, alongside his guru and mentor, who is also here with us. We are privileged to have uh, Shekhar Dattatri, the celebrated wildlife filmmaker uh, over here. Uh, so he works alongside him on the Youth for Conservation Initiative. And he also works at HNC International School on a very interesting initiative called Kartavyam. Which, uh, which is all about conservation education for children, right? Right? Yeah. So that's Ram for you, and I'm eagerly looking forward to this conversation with Ram as well. So Ram and Mahesh, can I have you both gentlemen join me? Thank you. So Ram, maybe you take a little one. <laughs> okay, so here are your mics, gentlemen, on set. Uh, I just turn them on. So the format we follow is that uh, uh, for the next um, about 40 to 45 minutes, depending on how the questions flow, I will be in conversation with the two gentlemen. We will take breaks in between to introduce uh, some segments to you. Uh, they are known as popularly known as the quiz segments, and you will uh, have them come up at the right time, and there are these beautiful mugs to be won. And um, the uh, audience gets an opportunity to ask Ram and Mahesh questions uh, somewhere around 8, 5, 8, 10 for about 10 minutes. And then we always start and finish on time, so you can time your watches. This program will end at 8.29 PM. So uh, looking forward to the conversation, guys. All set? Okay. Fantastic. So let me ask um, my first question to Ram. Uh, and then I'll come to you, Mahesh, in a bit. Uh, so Ram, what was the earliest influence you had that directed you in, in, uh, in the direction of wildlife, nature, conservation, all of this? Because you could have just been a, uh, you know, another prolific academic that comes out of school, right? Definitely not an academic. <laughs> my earliest inspiration was my backyard and the place around my native place. So when I was in fifth or sixth standard, I just walked. So when you see a native place, what? It, it's Pudukote. Pudukote. Yes, and it's uh, surrounded by uh, scrub jungles. When I was in my fifth or sixth grade, I just stepped to my backyard and I found pea phones there. And it started as a fascination and a curiosity because what are all these birds and animals doing in my house and not in the forest? There used to be sunbirds, tailor birds and various kinds of uh, birds that live in my house. And slowly I started observing them. I used to follow a macaque that comes from the next house, it walks on the door of my house and then it gets to the mango tree and it sleeps there for three, four hours in hot sun. It's a, you know, it's a very hot place. I used to see these macaques probably in six, seven feet. And that's how it started. And slowly I had to come out because I couldn't see much in my backyard. And Pudukote was also a jackpot because it had a lot of ponds. If you look at a shot from an aerial view, there would be six, seven ponds in a photograph. And every time when I used to come back from school, I used to roam around those ponds, 
collect frog eggs, put it in the little fish tubs, wait for it to turn to tadpoles and froglets. So that that's what I was doing basically because uh, I didn't want to play cricket because I was uh, I can't speak much, so I didn't want to play cricket. And every time when I uh, my dad was a very very uh, highly influential person when it comes to nature because uh, every time when he comes back from his pharmacy. He used to take me to show slender lorises and spotted owlets. So, you know, we would just go on a drive to places like Sitanavasal and uh, we would see slender lorises 15, 20 feet in a small uh, scrub jungle bush. And that's how my uh, interest in natural history started. It didn't start as a passion, it purely started as a fascination and a curiosity. So what are these animals doing there? And you know, it's, it was just sheer joy and it was just something that I can fo follow all of by myself without talking to anybody. So that's how we started. Oh, fantastic. Uh, I just want to add here that both his parents are present here. Uh, we have uh, Kumar and uh, Mrs. Kumar, both of them. Uh, sir, Mupir Kumar, then, sir, Kumar and Mrs. Kumar, both of them are here. And I'm sure they, they will enjoy the conversation as much as we will. Uh, so let me ask you, uh, uh, Related question. So, uh, interest in in in, uh, in nature and and, and in uh, uh, you know the fascination you talked about to uh, to natural history on one side. But how did you lean towards photography and later on towards filmmaking? We'll go to filmmaking a little later. But photography, how did it start? It started because my uh, dad's for my dad's 25th wedding anniversary, he gifted me a camera. And I'm glad that I started first as a naturalist and then as a photographer because I wasn't just going around with a camera clicking whatever I see. Uh, I was fascinated by nature much before I got a camera. And when I got a camera, it was a tool for me to uh, document these beautiful uh, biodiversity. And that's when I was also moved to Chennai. And it suddenly opened up my uh, exposure to wildlife. I could uh, get Sanctuary Asia magazine from the stands. I could go to British Council to read uh, National Geographic and BBC. It was a Nature Quest was an organization that had just started. So every month there used to be uh, an activity on wildlife. People used to come and talk about turtles, orchids from Bayanad, and uh, you would see uh, documentaries like Queen of Trees. These all just uh, furthered my interest because uh, I was doing some field work and I was also reading and watching natural history. It was brilliant. And when I got a camera, I started shooting transparencies. I feel bored when I talk about this, but I do have a role of... You feel bored? Yes. So, I do a lot. I used to do a lot of photography in Peria. I used to go there, talk to the deputy directors there, tell them that I'm interested How in this. How old were you when you were doing all this? I was in 9th and 10th. Photography was 9th and 10th. Okay. So, one fine day, I had a bunch of slides and uh, I, pho uh, I was photographing in Peria. And that was the exact time I also attended a film screening in Satyam. It was uh, one of Shaker's films, it's Nagar Bhai, from the Indian jungle. And it was just magical because uh, you're watching a blue chip natural history film on a big screen with that sound, jaw dropping wildlife, wild dog sequence, radio calling tigers, the tigers call. They, it just uh, blew me and the gripping interaction just blew me. So I sneaked through the crowd and I wanted to meet the Shaker. So I told him, you know, I'm very much interested in wildlife, I can I come and meet you. So he just said, you know, you can call and come, he gave me his card, you can call and come. So I went back home, I called my dad, you know, this, this filmmaker, Shekhar, you just uh, have to come from Pudukote because they have to go and meet him. Then um, he got a bus, he came and got some papayas for the regular uh, tradition. So we went home and he had the slide sorter that was arranged. It's basically a device that emits white light and you can keep slides in it and a little loop. Uh, that is like a magnifying glass, so you can see each slide. So he saw every slide and he moved most of it to the left, except two. It was a photograph of a cruiser butterfly and a barking deer. So he said, uh, this is also not uh, so good, but uh, I don't want to disappoint you, but keep trying. So that was the first uh, positive feedback that I received and uh, of somebody's film that I just watched. Since, since then I've been knocking his doors to get my ass kicked so that I go back, improve and uh, perform better in the work that I do with schools and the education. That's, That's how it happens. That's how it happens. You know, two, two points I'm picking up here. One is, look at the excitement in his voice. He's talking about things that happened like almost 15 years ago, but he's still referring to them as if they've just happened. 
it is so fresh. And I really hope, Ram, this stays fresh with you when you reach my age and beyond. You know, and I'm sure it will. You know, the, the kind of passion you are exuding is amazing. The other point I'm picking up is uh, Campbell again. Doors will open, and uh, you know, some, you know, by his father would have gifted him anything, but his father gifted him a camera, right? Uh, his, uh, and he could have been in Satyam theater watching any other movie, but this. But he ended up watching Shaker's movie, uh, Shaker's film, and uh, he could have met Shaker, and Shaker could have said, if, if, if I didn't know Shaker, I would have imagined Shaker could have said this. But Shaker would, is not the kind of person who's going to say, Shabash, great work. You know, Shaker is the honest guy who's going to give you honest perspective. And a coach's greatest role is to be able to raise the bar for the person that is being coached, or the person who's looking up to being coached. And that's really what I'm picking up from your story, that, uh, you know, Shaker's um, uh, conversation with you at that moment was very pivotal in encouraging you to do better, right? Actually, it was not a conversation. Huh? It was a point blank arrow. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'll, I'll pause your story and move to Mahesh's uh, story here. Mahesh's story uh, as, uh, you know, is, is really very interesting because here's a person who uh, seemed to have devised this um, uh, structure of 25, 25, 25. It's a model, I call it. Uh, 25 to uh, years to uh, learn, 25 years to earn, and 25 years to enjoy. So I, I'm really curious to understand uh, at, at what time in your life did you come up with this 25, 25, 25 math? Uh, and um, uh, it's nice to have a math. We all, you know, as I as I used to, I, I wrote in my, you know, the journal that I was looking up today really had an uh, entry saying, I want to be the prime minister of India. And uh, uh, my personal journal. So, but then I've given up that, uh, you know, that, that direction long back in my life. So, my quest, related question is, uh, how did you come to the math, and how did you stay on course? Uh, were you not drawn by the temptations of of the high flying corporate life? High flying, ladies and gentlemen, is that he was EVP and MD at Cognizant when he quit, and he was managing a billion dollar business for them. You know, uh, business worth billion dollars. So that's a lot to give up. So, how did you do that? Uh, good evening and thanks for having me here. And before I get into that, I just want to clarify the initial introduction you did. The moment you used the word Padiks, my son turned towards me and said, Padiks so, <laughs> 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 are. Yeah. 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 Identity of a customer to one. Identity of a customer to one. Identity of a customer to one. So, to your question, uh, I think it all started in, uh, in college. Uh, you know how uh, college life is, uh, especially when you are in a hostel, you tend to discuss everything under the sun in your hostel room and at 2 a.m. in the morning, starting from how you're going to change the world and the problem to discussing every step of the item number of Lina Das in Ait Bar movie. You, you cover everything under the sun and during one of those uh, late night uh, discussions, um, Someone, we were talking about our future, what we want to do, uh, etc. And one of them mentioned about this interview that he heard that talked about a wealthy man and how he wants to distribute his wealth. Uh, and he said, uh, one third of my wealth I want to uh, give to my children, one third I want to give to charity, and one third I want to spend on myself. So the third part is what intrigued us a lot. He said, like, wow, this, this is phenomenal. And, if you have to earn and enjoy during your lifetime, that's brilliant. And uh, at that point in time, we did not graduate yet, we did not got a job yet, but the discussion we had was how to quit, and we had a bet amongst ourselves on who would quit the corporate job at the earliest. So that was a starting point on uh, why we came to the zone of let's get the the wealth as quickly as possible and we're doing different things across uh, across the world but come out of it as quickly and start spending money on yourself so that was the starting point and uh, obviously uh, we all went our ways uh, everybody had their own careers the toughest part i guess is um, when you quit um, at what point you want to quit and i think it, it all depends on the trigger that it has uh, for different people the triggers are very different and to me, um, 
I mean, I was very, very lucky. I, um, I after TCS, I moved into Cognizant. When I moved into Cognizant, we were just about 300 employees. And when I quit, we were about 150,000 employees. So I grew with the company, um, great company. The growth that we have had is phenomenal. And as an early uh, person who joined the company, I got all the freedom in the world to do what I want. And uh, so I grew very rapidly there. Um, but as I grew with the company, I realized one thing that uh, there are a lot more smarter guys who are much younger than me who are doing a phenomenal job. And I was there because I was there. I was, uh, I, I had my time. I'm a leader in the organization, and everybody was looking up to me. But beyond that, I felt I was really not adding any value. Uh, and uh, the younger guys are much smarter. And uh, why am I here just as a block? Uh, yeah, the, the age gives me the benefit, but beyond that, um, somehow it was, uh, I was not happy with what I was doing. Um, and uh, obviously, when you're successful and uh, I was managing, like you said, a billion dollar portfolio at the time, uh, so everything was going positive as far as the career is concerned. But the sheer idea of continuously reinventing yourself and wanting to do something different all the time, and uh, seeing that the others are much smarter and uh, doing much better, I somehow felt I should not be earning a pension while I'm earning a salary. So I decided that's enough. Uh, and uh, I quit on my birthday uh, and on a planned basis. At that point in time, I, I mean, obviously, the, the whole idea of 25, 25, 25 was based on those three buckets that we heard during the college times. Uh, so it was. It has a zinc to it, yeah, 25, 25, 25, but in real life, personally, the first 25 happened, yeah, but the second 25 was 23, but I'm not complaining because I added two more years to the last 25, uh, but uh, that's how it happened. Uh, just to split uh, your thought into three buckets on, you spend more, the one, one third of your life uh, gaining knowledge, second gaining wealth, and third gaining personal experience. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, I want to come back to you. So the math in your personal case is 25, 23, 27. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. I want to come back to that that decision around the birthday time that you quit. But, uh, you know, a key point that we need to uh, understand here, the career was progressing. There was a lot of responsibility uh, from 300 people organization to one 150K organization. Uh, the portfolio of business being managed was $1 billion. But, I was not happy. You know, that's a very important point. Now, many of us are caught in that space where there is growth, but there is a vacuum. And we are struggling to relate to and uh, understand why that vacuum is there in the first place. When you seemingly have everything, you know, all of them are in the you you reason, society makes you reason like that. And I want to come to that point now and ask you a very, uh, very uh, you know, focused question. Describe that time when you had to now take that call to quit. Uh, and did you, uh, did you, did the organization not try to hold you back? Uh, or did, did, did you at any point in time um, kind of uh, sway between clarity and insecurity? Uh, clarity and fear, let us say. What will happen if I quit? Uh, will I, you know, I'll, I'll be losing an important income stream. And I do understand IT jobs do come with a lot of uh, perks. Yeah. You're going to give away a lot of that. Yeah. So how was that moment and what clinched it finally? So to, to me, I, I think the, uh, obviously when, when you are at a, at, a, at, a, at a place in the organization where the an executive, obviously there is a lot of money that you need to leave on the table if you decide to quit. Any 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 corporate person would have a dilemma. For me, what I have was more important than what I possibly would lose if I come out. So I, that part of the math was never in my mind. That what what is, what is it I'm going to lose if I come out now? But the decision of quitting was very very clear to me. Um, but it happened uh, uh, over a period of time. I. I internalized it obviously that uh, I need to quit uh, at a certain point in time, but obviously I want to time it right. Um, so I uh, I discussed obviously the, the management was very supportive. They 
they tried retaining all right, but uh, at the same time, I, I, I was very clear on what I want to do. And, uh, and so uh, they were very supportive on me getting out of it. But the idea of uh, quitting is very difficult when things go extremely well for you as a, as a company, as an organization, as a carrier. You see no reason why you need to quit because everything is uh, stacked up uh, for you. But the whole idea of what else can you do if you come out of it is such a liberating feeling that you have to pull the trigger at some point in time. And I thought the sooner we do that, the better because all the things that you want to do, if you do it at the peak of your health and life, it's much better than when you, you get everything and finally you realize, uh, yeah, I'm now at the end of uh, my retirement age and now my health is not okay. So what do I do now? So I, I want to accumulate as much as that life as possible so that I can do several things that I wanted to do in my life. And very clearly, I didn't want to get back to the corporate world. I, that was a very, very conscious decision of not getting back to corporate, not going back to the nine to five job, but do several things that, uh, that I can have an impact on, either personally or the community. So that feeling of, you know, the liberating feeling of what or what all you can do and what all you can impact is far more powerful than just sticking on to what you're doing on a day to day basis. That's that was that drove the decision. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm gonna come back to you for, for more on that. But you know, what I'm picking up again is something very, very beautiful. He says he uh, uh, was more focused on what he has than what we, he would have in the future. And here I will, full, you know, kind of satisfy all my, all my fellow Rumi lovers. Rumi says, forget the future. I worship anybody who can do that. So it's a very powerful thing if you can forget the future and think of what you have than what you will have. And the second point he talks about is the, the liberation, that sense of liberation about the immense possibilities that await us if we let go of what we are clinging on to and are willing to explore the world with open arms. That's what he's really talking about. And his exploration is very powerful. We'll come back to that. Um, but before I go to Ram, in, um, in my next set of questions for Ram, I'm going to take a quick break to come to you, to the audience, to give you your uh, mugs through my quiz questions. Okay? Now, these questions are on my two guests today. And just to see how well you are engaged, these are very easy, simple questions. If you've heard every word which has been spoken, you'll find that these questions are easy to answer. And whoever answers, and my decision will be final if two, two people shout at the same time, two hands go up at the same time, uh, whoever catches my attention gets the mug. So my first question is on Mahesh. Okay? Are you all ready? Yes. Yes. Please connect Kumar Mangalam Birla to Mahesh. The family cannot answer. I thought I heard the answer in the back. Can somebody give me the answer in the back? Come forward. Yes. Right here. Sir, please come forward. Can Can somebody else give the full answer so the audience knows? Birla Institute of Technology. Bits Pilani. Bits Pilani. Absolutely right. Bits Pilani. He's the Chancellor. Kumar Mangala Birla is the Chancellor of the University. What's your name? I'm Srivatsa. Srivatsa. Thank you. Thank I'm you. Oh, you're a bit spilani on the side. Maybe I should have disqualified you. Nevertheless. Okay. Okay, this one is, I think, equally easy. So don't kill me if you don't get the answer. Okay, at least I framed it with equal level of ease. Okay. Uh, please connect Ram to a very famous Raj Kapoor film. Look at the silence. Yes? <laughs> well, I didn't, I, I didn't see the connection there. I'll still give it to her. I'll still give it to Rachita because she didn't know the question was coming. Okay. Please come forward, Rachita. Yes. And this is a beautiful moment because they both are going due to get married. Yes, it is Ram Teri Ganga That was a 1985 Raj Kapoor film. And uh, because uh, Ram has written this book on Ganga being more than a river, 
uh, I, I framed that question, but I had no clue Rachita was going to answer it. <laughs> Nor did she have a clue that she was going to answer it. Anyway, thank you. So let's continue with the conversation. And for those of you who, who had the answers and who didn't get the mugs, please keep joining us every last Saturday. There are more mugs. <laughs> and, uh, you will have your chance, uh, your moment in the sun as well. Okay. Uh, Ram, coming back to you. So you met Shaker and that was an important point. But this, at one level, passion is very different from um, pursuit, right? When you, you are passionate about something, but to be able to decide, you need an inflection point. You need something to tell you, man, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Uh, was there any such incident that happened in your life? I have that incident only now, that this is what I want to do something in, something in my life. But uh, when I, uh, one of the, main influences for me to pursue this was a short uh, work in Ogunbe because I was neither a Parish like Mukesh and I didn't come from a, I didn't come from a great uh, alumni background so when I was in my bachelor's I was looking at every opportunity to uh, find a place where I can just be in forest for many months so whenever I used to open magazines like Sanctuary and all that, I used to read the last letters of uh, editor kind of page and I used to look at who all has given their email IDs, send uh, emails <laughs> to everybody and you know, if, is there an opportunity where I can come? Because it's very, very hard. And uh, at that time, I wanted to become a filmmaker. Not now, at that time. So there was one opportunity where uh, a very acclaimed filmmaker, Sandesh Kadur from Bangalore, he said, I'm doing a documentary on King Cobras and uh, it's for National Geographic, but uh, we are doing that documentary. We want to come and uh, assist us. Uh, I said, it's incredible because that was the opportunity for me to quit college. <laughs> At that time, I have not even been to college more. So I have not been to a rainforest before, nor have I even seen King Cobras, which is one of the, it's the longest venomous snake in the world. And I had absolutely no idea about the difficulty of being in a rainforest, we wouldn't work. <laughs> but I just said, uh, let me go, I packed my bag and everything, I went to there and it was for seven months, it was from March until September. And as a field assistant, you have to do everything, which is actually incredible because you get to learn every single uh, aspect and you, you get to uh, prove yourself, you get to, you know, right from cleaning cars to cleaning equipment to recording sound, you get to do everything. So one of the uh, incidents was uh, filming a <coughs> king cobra building a nest. So picture is a 14 feet long snake building a nest. It happens towards the end of May where uh, this particular snake, the female king cobra, it finds a spot, it makes its body into a noose like this and it gathers a pile of leaves and it will put it on top in one place and it will keep doing that. And it will keep doing that for a long time that the nest would, you know, the length would be around uh, 5 to 6 feet and the height would be 2 to 3 feet. And uh, this is happening in a place which is the second wettest place in India. And it receives torrential downpour at that time. And 110 days, approximately 110 days after the female king cobra lays its eggs, the, during the torrential downpour, and when the hatchlings come out of the eggs, you will not find a single drop of water in the egg chamber. You know, that's how amazing uh, nature is. So that was a moment uh, that, I, that I really thought, okay, this is what uh, I wanted to do. But later I changed my mind. I didn't want to do that. <laughs> so that, that was the moment. That, so it, it, it kind of gave, gave you that focus at that time. Yeah. But it was an important part of your journey, right, in a sense. Definitely, because it tested my endurance and it showed how incredible rainforests are because every square feet of rainforest you will find something. And you will not find animals like charismatic tigers, but you will find incredible insects, amazing mud puddling butterflies, bush frogs that you will not find anywhere that's colored orange and uh, green. So it is an incredible place if you are a naturalist. How did you negotiate, your parents are here, so, but how did you negotiate not being in college and being in Agumbe, for example, or on many of your other nationalist escapades? Well, I have a very good equation, I have a very good equation with my dad. 
So he wanted to become a doctor, but he couldn't. So he uh, knew what I wanted to become. But primarily, I had a lot of dialogue. Whenever I used to go for a film, film uh, screening event, or uh, whenever uh, somebody comes for talk, I used to take my mom. My mom and I were here in Chennai for from the ninth grade, and I used to take my parents, uh, my mom, along with myself. And uh, until two years back, uh, I was constantly having uh, dialogues, conversations, because that that was I, I had a lot of dialogues and conversations. I think he's making a very very important point. You know, a lot of uh, life decisions can only be uh, influenced and taken through conversations and through vision sharing. A more crude way of saying it is by selling your idea. And I think we all have to be very good salespeople to be able to sell our ideas to parents, to spouses, to siblings, to partners. And unless you, you sell those ideas, you're not going to get support. So I think I can totally relate to this fact about having a dialogue with the family and engaging them in what they believe in doing. And uh, I, I want to here celebrate uh, the parents as well, uh, both Mrs. and Mr. Kumar. <laughs> I can't picture I can't picture Ramnath Chandrasekhar, the doctor, or the uh, or the uh, engineer talking so enthusiastically about what he's doing. You know, as much as I definitely not right. As much as I can picture him sitting right here and feeling uh, taking us into that rainforest in Agumbe. I'll come back to you, Ram, very quickly. But uh, let me go to Mahesh's story here. So, Mahesh, when you quit. What was the idea? What is this definition of enjoy? Enjoy can mean anything. You could have just put up your feet at home and uh, let your, um, uh, you know, ROI have take care of you. You know, uh, obviously people do, unlike me and money, people do make prudent life financial decisions. Uh, but you know, uh, you could have done that. But you, you seem to have taken a very uh, interesting uh, path. Uh, so can you walk us through what your definition of the enjoy phase is really all about? and how it has unfolded so far. <coughs> so after, after I quit uh, Cognizant, um, I, um, I, I was very in bad shape when I, when I was in uh, the contact world based on travel and stress levels and everything. So I said I'd first take care of that. So first one year, I, I took care of my health, fitness, and all that good stuff. Then I said every, every alternate year, I would travel India. Uh, and every other alternate year, I will do a personal project for myself. So uh, I quit uh, on my 48th birthday, and when I entered the uh, 50th uh, year, um, I said I will travel India, and I will do different things that are factors of 50. So 50 or something, 25 or something. So I said I will uh, visit 50 places of worship, 25 nature spots in India, 10 Indian festivals, 5 unique villages, 2 unique personalities, and 1 personal project. So if you sum all that up, you'll get 93. So I said, I'll do 93 by 50. So that comes to my project thing of 1.86. And I called it project 1.86, and I traveled across India. Um, and through that, I, I not just saw India in a very different lens, but I also met a lot of different people. What does this travel really mean? Like you took a plane, you went somewhere, you booked yourself into a hotel, how did you do it? So I, I used the first one year to plan for the next one year. Uh, I published a calendar, uh, and anybody who was interested can join me. I didn't include my family at all in the planning. So if they want to join, they can join. So for some, my, uh, my son, first son joined, some my uh, wife joined. Some of my friends from US traveled for this and joined me, but predominantly I, I published the entire calendar, took a uh, uh, flight to various places, and then booked the trains, hotels. I didn't, I didn't have the uh, mind to do backpacking and just go anywhere. Maybe the fear of unknown, I don't know what I'm missing, but maybe the next year when I start, I may start doing that. But essentially, just uh, use the one year to plan out the entire year because the things that I wanted to see in India are not the normal places. It's all abnormal, very difficult to reach, and things which we don't even know exist in India. Uh, and so that, that, that travel really helped me to see what India has to offer. 
and more importantly, the, the, the type of people that I saw during those uh, visits are uh, amazing stories. Uh, and that I did for one full year. Then uh, the last year, again, I was back home. Uh, I wanted to, when I quit Cognizant, one of the things I told myself is when I looked at all my bachelors in college, all of us are doing the same degree, but now each one is in different fields altogether. And the thought was, what if I had not come into IT? Could I have made an impact on an industry which I absolutely don't know? So I picked the industry which I love. Uh, my family is all musicians. Uh, so I said I should do something for music. And I, uh, I tied up with a few musicians, uh, helped them on um, uh, creating a music documentary and the music went to Grammys at that, that time. Um, I started some uh, something specific for, for music at my home, like you said, the degree. So the entire year I spent time on focusing on those individual projects. And again, I next year, starting August, uh, I, I time it with my birthday. So from August to August, I travel. You travel. And then again, I travel. As part of that, the enjoyment comes from different things that I want to do, be it music, photography. I learned photography after I quit Cognizant. Uh, I learned it formally uh, from some uh, online US uh, outfits. Um, and you're an amazing photographer. He's an amazing photographer, by the way. Yeah, His I mean, pictures it's, uh, are very candid, very, very beautifully. Uh, yeah, shot. and that helped uh, in, in a way. Uh, <coughs> photography is a means to an end. Also, I, 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 I realized that if I have to get into an industry, I don't know, like the Karnataka scene in in in, in Chennai. Uh, the easiest thing to do is to go to every sabha out there and start taking pictures of all these uh, artists and give it to them and they become friends immediately. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then the, the conversation was very, very easy for me to bring them home, talk about my project, and that's how I, I used some of those, uh, you know, various interests to, to suit my, my needs. But uh, but essentially, anything that uh, uh, that is interesting, any, any person that is interested, <coughs> anything to do with education, I go and uh, I help. Uh, and in the process, uh, the, the type of people, for example, during one of those travels, I met a, uh, I met a tea wala uh, in Katak, who every day used to uh, earn whatever he earns and put 50% of what he earns into a bucket. And then uh, he invited me and said, let me tell you what I do with that money. So he, he, he took me to his slum area, and he built a school right in front of the slum. And he says, I use all this half the money to fund the teachers so that the slum children can come and and come and learn. And so such powerful uh, you know, people that you meet, it's, it's amazing what you can do with such people. Uh, say maybe we met some, some teacher in uh, Gujarat area who was doing a phenomenal job. So all small things, uh, small uh, you know, excitement you get by helping them, but the impact or the multiplier effect that you create based on your own personal knowledge and what you can do you basing on your corporate uh, Experience, the, the it's incredible what you can do with that. So that's how I. I think what I'm hearing Mahesh really say is that there is a lot more to life than uh, work and uh, feeding yourself. Uh, that's really is what his experience is showing. His definition of enjoyment is going and experiencing uh, the big beautiful world. Now, most, most of the time I do find, and I was also pretty much like that, is that we tend to intellectualize life. You cannot uh, put, put life into a framework where you assess it purely on economic gain or loss. I don't think you can value the moment you had with that Diva. When you discovered that he's actually funding the uh, teachers in order to uh, you know, help educate some kids. A Tiwala are doing that. You can't, you can't put value to these things. Most things in life are free, and yet they are priceless. So I think that's what I'm picking up. And that would not have come if you're not straight out, if you're not ventured out of uh, of that corporate role that, was, that that you were in, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, I'll go to Ram now. Uh, Ram, I'm very curious to know. Because I did hear you say that that's what you wanted to do then, but then uh, you, you, you found more recently what you really want to be doing. So can you walk us through that journey between starting off as an actualist, uh, then getting into uh, you know experimenting with different media, uh, you know photography, filmmaking, all of that, 
and it's coming into cons uh, conservation education now. You know, so was there a transition that went happened in your mind, and uh, or or uh, was it an act natural progression? It wasn't a natural progression, and I would say that the transition is still happening. When I came back from Morgan Bay, I wanted to do something that is of a broader purpose, and that's also because of my because of the influence that I had uh, Shaker, and that's when. Uh, I actually discuss, I always discuss with my dad about what I wanted to do. So I told my dad, you know, if I pursue for another 8-10 years in filmmaking, I may become some filmmaker. But I wanted to explore and find out something that what I want to do, primarily. So he said, uh, if this is the time to experiment, you can go and experiment, I would definitely allow it. Then I went back to Shaker and I told him, you know, I, I want to do something different, I don't want to do this. And he had ideas for working with uh, young people. How can we connect young people with conservation, forest and wildlife conservation? It was a, it was something that I had not tried before uh, at all. I had, uh, I would have probably gone to a school and addressed uh, students once. But in 2010, when uh, Shaker told me that you can work with young people in conservation, I also found that in a very interesting because I love sharing stories. And I love uh, uh, I love to talk about forests and wildlife. And that was the exact time he had made a film called The Tooth About Tigers and another film called The Save Our Show Last. He said, uh, you know, you can take this to schools. So I will take this documentary in my car with the entire equipment, screens, projectors, mics, along with black curtains, so that you have to watch documentary in the right way. And Go to these schools. In places like Pudukote and Tirichi, there are people who will connect me with schools. And some people uh, in places like Kothegi and all, they would say, Then I started uh, talking about this uh, film called Tigers. Then I started talking about Then I started talking about Tigers. I started talking about Shola Forest, which is where most of the peninsular Indian rivers originate, like Kaveri, Krishna, and Godavari. And by the time that project ended, I had uh, addressed 50,000 students in Tamil Nadu, in 18 districts. And I said, you know, I have to find more ways because I felt that, you know, you are just engaging one off. Like, let's say, for example, if somebody wants to become a filmmaker, there is a learning curve. Somebody wants to become a doctor, you have to study for six, six years, ten years. There is a learning curve for everything. But if you want to take part in uh, protecting forests and wildlife, if you want to become an ecologically conscious citizen, there isn't a learning curve. There are only talks. And that may, that may inspire, because most of the people like me and many naturalists, well, they were inspired by a talk. But today in this saturated world of media where you're listening to so many people, you're exposed to so many things, you need the various mediums where you can connect young people during their formative years. So, so is that how you got connected with let us say HLC and, and create a curriculum? Absolutely. That's how I got connected with uh, HLC. Okay. Do you and want to talk about that later? H the initiative with HLC was uh, very uh, unique. They had, uh, it is a school in Semenjiri. And one fine day I got an email from the principal of the school. And he said, uh, I would like to send some of my students to your house. And I would like them to spend one or two days with you. I was actually stumped because I have been to schools, but I haven't, uh, you know, I hadn't had student visitors to my home. So they came home, they shadowed me, they saw what I'm doing, they asked a lot of questions, and I found their uh, philosophy of learning very, very interesting. So when I wanted to take a break from whatever work I was doing, I wanted to do my masters. So I went back to uh, the. Uh, person who runs HLC and I said, you know, I'm going to, uh, I want to do something bigger and I want to do my master's in education and I come back. Uh, he said, uh, uh, why don't you just stay here? We have a really good initiative called Kaktavyam. You can build whatever you want in that. So it was again a fantastic opportunity where somebody is giving a blanket uh, uh, opportunity in a school with 380 students, 56 teachers and an incredible uh, way of uh, uh, connecting with education. And I decided to develop a curriculum where I modeled on wildlife conservationists. For example, if you look at any wildlife conservationist, they would have first observed 
the natural world. And they would have spent a lot of time exploring them by going there, reading about it, and they would have solved a particular problem on the ground, like the Amur Falcon story, or like the mining in Kudramur, and they would have been effective communicators. <coughs> Talk about it. Because there are, you know, in, in 1.2 billion people who are directly and indirectly connected to nature and wildlife, there would probably be 1,000 people talking about it. So I wanted more young people to take part in it, and I want to build it from scratch. So he said, uh, Naveen said, OK, let's uh, do this. So we built a module called uh, Become an Observer, Become an Explorer, Become a Problem Solver, and Become a Storyteller. And uh, if you look at any change maker, any socially uh, changing individual, be it wildlife or any field, they would have had this curve. So we, ha we had a pilot program of that that I worked with. Uh, so you actually effectively created a framework yes. for, for young minds yeah. to be taken through. Yes. So that it, you give them your choice to, uh, to take up conservation. Yeah, how as, as a full time. Yes. Not as a full time. How can you take part from your own career? And you need that path. Right. And some of them may come in as a, as a full time Definitely. resource. If as you well. connect connect with them regularly, they will. They will. Yes. But you can still be pursuing some other career but be more aware and responsible. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So this is again a very powerful exposition of how the uh, the universe kind of connects the dots. And uh, in his case, the, the principal of agency reached out to you, yeah. right? And gave you this carte blanche to do what you wanted, which is for the first time create a curriculum yes. that gave children a wide range of choice to touch and feel this subject. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. So uh, I want to ask you, uh, you said it is evolving, yeah. right? Now, I'm going to ask you a very personal question. You're free not to answer it. Uh, there is Rachita here in the audience as well. Yeah. I, I think when you're alone, when you're single, that, uh, there are some choices that you can make. Uh, in your case, your dad's been very supportive, your mom's been very supportive. Yeah. But then once you, and many of us, I can, you know, why people are laughing is because they can relate to what I'm about to say. <laughs> they can almost sense it. When, when, a, when a new person comes into your life, yeah. And then the, the, the demands and pressures of family, raising a family come up. Yeah. You really don't have that freedom of choice. Have you really thought about it? Does it concern you at all? Uh, oh, yes. In, in fact, the universe conspired for that. Because every time when I go to these school talks, uh, adult talks, like uh, older people, they would say, I hope you find somebody who's interested in your line. I hope you'll find somebody who's interested so in your line. So the blessings line. came in? Yeah. So, <laughs> I, so I actually found a person from a small town in Jharkhand who had another big patch of forest behind where she saw jackals and all that. Okay. And uh, uh, she is equally interested in, um, uh, in a career in social enterprise. Very nice. So, so, so it is working as of now, right? Yes. As I again had a dialogue. Ah, okay. okay. <laughs> I had a lot of dialogue. So I always do that. You know, I don't know if anyone has told you this, but if they have not, let me be the first person. You have a very mature head on your shoulders. You are very, very, very mature ahead of It's fantastic. Um, I have a related question for you, Mahesh. Uh, I think, you know, uh, please do talk a little bit about Madrasana, of course. But when you're doing Madrasana and you're doing uh, something that's socially powerful, you know, like uh, conserving music and giving it a new flavor, you also record the videos of, uh, high quality videos of uh, artists and give it to them for promotion. Uh, so you do all of that in Madrasana, but also on the other side, uh, living the life of um, enjoyment where the income stream is closed does have its challenges, right? Uh, do you face those challenges? Are there any uh, uh, times when you sit up and say, uh, maybe I should be doing something to earn an income also? Yeah, good question. Uh, when I decided to quit, um, obviously I, I shared that first with uh, my wife and she was very supportive. My uh, my father used to be a, a, a French writer. Uh, he, he has written close to about 19 books. And after he passed away, uh, Aruna started uh, distributing those books. We wanted to continue that business till the textbook changed. Changed. So she was doing that, and uh, the conversation with uh, Aruna was, "Yeah, I, I plan to quit. Is it okay?" And she was very supportive. And we wanted to talk about this to the children as well. So we took them out for dinner and uh, and I told them, hey, I'm, I'm going to quit. So the younger one, he didn't know how to react. He was somewhere here in the audience. That he is. Yeah. So he uh, he looked at uh, Aruna and said, 
அந்த அப்பா பிசினஸ் போயிருக்கும் இல்லையா the whole whole thing i mean i could understand what, what is going through the mind oh what's going to happen with uh, all the salary gone uh, so it's funny i mean how how people think but to me uh, i mean i think i was very lucky as i said because i uh, i joined the company very early on the the uh, the finance part of it was was okay but what you uh, what you missed is obviously the industry was very kind of required there a lot of offers that came to me but i i was very very clear that if i change the equation to if i have a certain corpus in my with me which i can spend on things i like that was a lot more different than thinking about what if i want to make more money so the, the equation was very different in my mind um so it didn't it didn't bother me on uh, there are a lot of the, uh, i mean i was part, part of a board member for a company till it got acquired so those things came in but i i didn't really do it for the sake of getting money into the into the bank but more to help someone and that's about it um on the on the magrasna part of it um so we uh, I, i got very lucky to got introduced to a uh, lovely musician called pradeep kumar who has sung all the great songs in kabali and others and won national award he uh, he had a very pet project called purva where he went and recorded uh on the green others quietly in uh, western orchestration going to boston and recording the whole thing and i got introduced to him and i funded the, the whole documentary that he created through him i got introduced to a lot of other interesting musicians like sean golden and others uh and one of the days when sean, sean and i were talking we, we realized that there is this whole idea of carnatic music uh what are we here today are more in sabas and other things what if we give a totally different uh, environment to both the uh, listeners as well as to, to the artists that was a starting point for us to start mantras now where we remove a lot of uh, noise give clean uh, sound uh, so that the experience is much better the ambience is very different and people who have uh, attended the concerts feel that uh, their connect with the artist is much stronger and it became quite popular and a lot of artists and a lot of rasikas came home and listened to it but during the process we realized that there is there is this another medium which is not there yet today in the, uh, in the social media which is to promote classical music in an absolutely distinct form where we focus only on the artists and nothing else so we created a separate youtube free youtube channel called madras nanplak where we record one song to one artist five minutes and every friday it gets featured and that became very popular and we were very very happy to see the results of it it, uh, it went uh, some of the videos went viral uh, some of the young musicians who have never been exposed to the outside world got calls from new zealand and uk and uh, so it, it, it gives us great pressure to see how the whole whole thing is going beyond uh, what we imagined uh, and in the whole process of course we uh, I, I, there's no commercial intent for Madras no per se, but whatever we create, we create the digital content, we throw it out, and whatever profit that comes, we share it with the artists, so that they, it gives them an alternate revenue mechanism for them to uh, increase their uh, revenue potential as well. Uh, so the idea is to, to do things where we are different, and we want to uh, focus on things which others have not done before. At the same time, it has that multiplier effect. Right? That was very, very key for us. Whatever we do. we have to make sure it has a big impact for the artists and that's how the madras nan club started and we're trying to expand the whole portfolio on what the art form can come into the world and hopefully in the future we'll start including other art forms as well in madras nan great uh, i i love the madras nan story i'm not going to talk much about it because he has elaborated it but the point he made earlier really really interests me i think if you look around us and a lot of us are Uh, are victims of this thinking that our desire to earn comes more from insecurity of what will happen if we stop earning rather than focusing on how can we spend what we have earned in order to fulfill all that we want to do you know there's a big paradigm shift that he talked about you know there was uh, this decision to quit and young nishant obviously asked a very very uh, important question of his father you know uh, as to where the mula will keep coming from 
But the way he was thinking, and possibly uh, here Aruna's uh, role uh, is very important, that she gave him all the support, where he was thinking is, how can we go live the life that we are capable of living with what we have? And I think if you change the paradigm, a lot of opportunities open up, uh, which, is, which is a very important point that you made, Mahesh. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, I'm going to ask two quick buzzer round questions, okay, before we go to the, uh, you know, quick, what shall I say, quick fire questions, before we go there. So keep the answer very brief so we can uh, take some questions from the audience. Uh, how do you deal with uh, worry, insecurity, uh, how do you deal with it? Does it arise? Well, I've been dealing with it uh, in a very terrible way until last year, but a couple of uh, points that I found during the last one year is that you have to learn to embrace uncertainty, point number one. Point number two is, if you are sincere and committed in the work that you do, other sincere and committed people will help you. If you don't have agendas behind your shoulder, if you don't want to, you know, uh, make use of a person, but I, I have only one thing. If somebody can introduce me to a school, and I'll take uh, take her students, I'll take whatever I have done, and I'll work there. And I have found a way to sustain myself through uh, doing freelance work online. I used to do key night, keynotes in the night. I used to do audio transcriptions so that I get some extra penny. And I've started working on different workshops. So embracing uncertainty and uh, being sincere and committed to working. Beautiful, beautiful. Mahesh, same questions. Do you, do you ever deal with worry, insecurity, the stream and stop, two young boys, uh, their futures, all those things? No, I think my uh, my situation is very different, right? I mean, I, I, I joined the company at the right time, so as far as financial insecurity is concerned, that's that's not my concern at all. Uh, but what, what concerns me is after I quit, a lot of people come and ask me, well, so when do I quit? Uh, <laughs> what's the right time to quit? And what I realize in all that is, they are stuck because they do not have any other interest other than work. The moment you have something else other than work, it will draw you. It, it will automatically draw you out, and the insecurity and other things will automatically draw you. Well, when is the right time to quit? What are you wanting to quit? Quit worrying right now. Quit existing right now. So the best time to live is now because it's the only moment we have. We don't know what's going to happen next. Uh, I know what's going to happen next. We're going to have the questions from the audience. Questions, please, not comments. I'm timing this. We have very little time. Uh, Geeta's question first. Uh, give the mic to Geeta. If the other hand can go up, then I'll know who's coming next. Yes. Go ahead, go ahead, Geeta. Yes, Young boy who enjoyed solitude and immersed yourself in watching birds and drinking a backyard and ponds. And now somebody who says, I'm ready for business, but I love shadows. Malama, Malama, can't hear. I'll, I'll repeat the question, please don't uh, worry. My kids are please. We'll repeat the question, I'll repeat the question, yes. So, is it your passion that has affected the sea change, the observing, the Watching to the story and learning curve that you know. is it your passion that has made you change from somebody who enjoys solitude to somebody who now sharing stories? I think Professor Dr. Abdul Kalam would be my great proud of you because you're dragging young minds to spread the wings of fire. So what made converted you to being a master storyteller? Somebody who enjoys I don't I don't like a master storyteller. That's just a good question, bro. Yeah, the, the question, question is, is uh, you have been pursuing solitude in the beginning, now you're talking I would say that 100% the passion is firing me up because in my field of uh, why, uh, talking about forests and wildlife or I would say communicating about forests and wildlife, it is a very minority, you know, there are very less people there, very very less people and if you put the environment then there are so much that will come into play. For example, instead of giving this, I got this from home. Okay, so this is also environment conservation. I can also talk about forests and wildlife. So my primary <coughs> passion now has been, you know, these are for forests that needs to be protected. Because India is an incredible country, which is where the kind of biodiversity that you find is nowhere else present. Himalayas, snow-capped mountains, rainforests, 
mangroves, salt forests, nowhere else in the world where you will find in a single geographical landscape all these. And if they are supporting around 1.2 trillion people directly or indirectly, but there are only 1,000, you know, more than 1,000 to 2,000 people who are speaking out for these forests. So I, I, I come from a very utopian background, but it's passion that drives me and uh, I have found the calling now. I have no, I haven't, it's, a, it's very hard because I started very early, I found multiple callings and finally I found one thing. But definitely, uh, what we teach children now will determine how forests are protected 15 years from now. I have to start now. That's what's driving me now. Thank you. I want to add here a point he made. I followed multiple callings, callings and then zeroed in on what I love doing and what I want to do. And it's a perfectly normal thing to do. We are passionate about many things, but what do we love doing the most and what can we be best at in the world is very important. And I, uh, you know, I want to concede here, you are very lucky that you found it at 27, 28, whatever, or maybe a little earlier. I found it at 35. So, uh, you know, you, you are more profitable than I am, you know. <laughs> okay, next question please, who is asking the next question? Next question, no questions? Yes, sir, yes, sir. One second, one second, sir. I, somebody's raised their hand. I'll come to you. Hello. In the lighter way, you've been extremely lucky. Yes, sir. Hailing from a place, Pudukotai, the rural areas, where you had an opportunity to really interact with nature. And, uh, experience of other guys in cities. I'd like to share with you, lizard is a common creature. In most of our houses. I have a relative in America who were supposed to visit India and I told them there's lizards. They have to think twice so they to make the visit. So that's the kind of fear. And I have a lady, neighbor, who comes to the village area in Chennai. She says, Mama, the Palipa then by when we were young, snakes used to crawl in our houses. We used to take it from the hand and throw it out. I mean, that's the kind of uh, background you all grow up and uh, that's when you have to be And I must appreciate uh, your commitment in growing up. With this. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, sir. Thank you, thank you. But we'd like questions, please. Questions. Is there are questions for the guests? You, you have a question? Sir, did you have a question or was it an observation? No, no, not a question, it's just a comment. Uh, I'll take it later, sir. I'm running out of time. I'll go here and then to Suresh for the last question. I have a question for Mahesh. Uh, Mahesh, the experiences that you're having uh, when you travel, are you already documenting it or do you have a plan of uh, writing it down in some form and sharing it with others? Yeah, right now I'm uh, just using Facebook as the medium. Uh, but uh, someone mentioned that I could uh, try a book. Uh, I thought one year of experience is not good enough. So I'm planning my next year, starting this August, for one more year. So hopefully with more experience and have more content to create a book or whatever. So that's there in mind. Thanks. Fantastic. Last question for the evening. This, this uh, from Rich. Uh, there's a lot we share in common, which we'll take it offline. But if you notice uh, the generation that's behind us, people like Ram, for instance, um, they are coming with a lot less baggage in terms of the legacy which we carry. We are now pressured to study well, get into the right school, get into the right college, blah, blah, blah. So uh, what, what do you think is, uh, is, is the kind of wiring these people have, you know, which we missed out you know, in that sense? I mean, I think you yeah. understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I, I think uh, the fear factor is not there at all, right? I mean, they, 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 the newer generation can choose to do what they want, when they want. Whereas we have certain compulsions on certain things on what we want to do. The whole equation of 25, 25, 25 will not exist at all in the next generation, I guess. It may be just 75, I guess, uh, all you know. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, you, you're right. The, the, the fearless attitude of the youngsters is something that uh, is very, very important. Very good. Remember that. So I think fear is, uh, is an important debilitating factor. It holds you back. But what are you fearing? Maratha Vichavan, Dandi Uttwa. So uh, that brings us to the end of the Q&A and we'll now go to the very interesting segment. So stay tuned everyone. We come with more mugs now.
And this time, my guests are going to ask you questions. And the right answer, again, um, uh, please allow me, I, I'll take the help of the guests to decide who, who answered right, okay? Uh, or if there are two answers, then who got it first, okay? So uh, I'll first invite Ram to ask his question. So he will ask you a question, and you have to answer to win this beautiful mug. And then we'll have Mahesh ask his question. So over to you, Ram. What are the two rivers that I mentioned that originate from the Shola Falls? Kaveri, Krishna, Godavari. Kaveri, Krishna, and Godavari. Which one? Who? Who? Yes. Kaveri, Krishna, and Godavari. Sorry, Mahi. I would like to introduce a young person. I'm sorry about that. So, can we have the answer again for the benefit of everyone? Yeah. Most peninsula Indian rivers, the one that I mentioned was Kaveri and Godavari and Krishna, because he has been to my talk before. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Mahesh, your question. So one of the things, uh, as part of my travels in India, I realize there are so many exotic places in India that a lot of people don't even know. So this question is regarding that. Which is uh, the village in India that is considered to have the biggest dinosaur egg hatchery in the world? If not the village, the state. Gujarat is okay, but anybody giving the village? Dimbetta. Dolaria. Dolaria. No. We are still with Gujarat. Anyone has the village name inside Gujarat? Okay, I'll give it to him. Krishna, please come forward. The village name is called Rayoli. Rayoli in Gujarat. In Gujarat. Please do visit that place. It's, it's, uh, from one photographer from a from a from a shishya to a guru, you know, because this is the Krishna, the great photographer. He'll be my guest on August 12th at the Artist Soul event at Wandering Artist. So Krishna is a very celebrated photographer doing some great work. Please join us. So beautiful. So can you please come forward? Can you give the answer out again in some detail so everyone gets. Uh, it's an idea of... Uh, so, Rayoli is this place in Gujarat. Uh, it, it's hectares and hectares of uh, land which are still... You can go and see the place. Uh, the Indian government has taken as much as possible from that, but left a lot of that uh, to nature. So, you can go and touch those fossils. You can uh, you can see the dinosaur eggs uh, with the locals there. Uh, there's a beautiful museum there as well. But more importantly, you can you can uh, the government couldn't cordon off the entire place. So the uh, the art part of the place uh, has uh, uh, a guest house homestay. You can stay with her, and she, the princess, actually takes you to the to the village where you can see everything. She will show you where the dinosaurs uh, bones are. You can touch them. She has a collection of dinosaur eggs. Uh, and uh, more importantly, uh, which was uh, surprising to me, is there is uh, uh, a dinosaur which is very specific to India called Rajasaurus uh, that uh, that came from Gujarat as well. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal place uh, you should not miss. Uh, so when you are in Gujarat, make sure you visit that place, the beautiful homestay as well. So you can enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, please bear with me. In the next four minutes, we will close this event. But as I go into uh, the last segment today, I want to, uh, on behalf of ODC, on behalf of our um, uh, gift partner, which is Hazel, on your seats, you must have found along with the bookmarks, these beautiful discount cards from Hazel and Madcap. Uh, so uh, please do make use of them, share them with friends. And without the support of ODC and Hazel, we can't be doing this event. So I will invite Vani to now give away uh, Small momentos from Hazel to both, uh, uh, you know, Mahesh and to Ram. And we have these beautiful list catcher trophies, which uh, I will hand over one to uh, Mahesh. Mahesh, this is your Hazel Hamper. And Ram, this is your list catcher trophy. And your Hazel Hamper. Fantastic. Please sit down. Um, 
Thank you so much for joining us. Every month, ladies and gentlemen, Odyssey makes a phenomenal effort to get this event together. So give them a round of applause. <laughs> Ashwin, the uh, CEO of Odyssey, could not be here today, uh, but Parangaman and his team are here, and they always make us feel very comfortable. I'm going to end this um, uh, uh, session talking a little bit about what I feel about uh, what we've just heard today. You know. Uh, up there on this promotion, there's a quote by uh, Joseph Campbell. And he says, life by itself does not have any meaning. You bring meaning to it. And being alive is that meaning. That's what Joseph Campbell said. I actually uh, relate a lot to this quote of Joseph Campbell from the point of view of what Osho said. Osho said, life has no meaning. So why are we doing all this drama? You know, you came with nothing, you're going to go with nothing. So what is all this drama about you know, achieving something, holding on to something, acquiring something, clinging on to something? So he says, drop all the drama. And then Campbell came by and gave this beautiful twist to it. And he said, it might be meaningless, it is meaningless, but you can bring the meaning to it. And I think that's what I pick up from these two stories of how two people, two different generations, I'm glad Suresh, you asked the question, uh, and Mahesh's generation is more like my generation, where uh, many people will uh, hesitate to quit something as big as uh, an EVP position, an MD position in a multinational company. And he brought meaning to his life by saying, there is only a finite time that I'm going to be around, so might as well do what I love doing. And that generation, which is Ram's generation, is, uh, you know, you're, you're very prophetic, I guess, you know, where for them it won't be 25, 25, 25 math at all. There will be no fear, so there will be a complete 75 math. You know, go live. The, the whole life, and uh, uh, you're bringing meaning in your own way by not only living the life that you want to live now, but you're actually encouraging others uh, who are in schools, you're, you're seeding them to the right thinking, which is, I think, very, very commendable. So thank you so much for making your lives meaningful and making our life meaningful this evening with your thoughts and perspectives. Thank you so much. On the 26th of August, we have a Madras Week special of the Bliss Catchers. We have storyteller and actor Janaki Savesh, uh, one of Chennai's very well-known faces, and her story of following her bliss. And we have Akila Krishnamurti of Ala, where she has uh, given up a media career, a journalistic career, to follow her bliss of being an art curator and manager. And so please join us on 26th of August, last Saturday of August. And if you like today's program and would like to follow me, uh, Avis Vishwanathan is the name, and you can download my app on Google Play or on the App Store to follow my blog posts, podcasts, and video blogs. I do share life lessons daily. That's what is my bliss. So feel free to stay in touch with me. I'll see you around, hopefully, next Saturday, uh, next month, last Saturday, which is 26th August. Thank you so much for joining us.